So I'm going to start out as I mean to go on. Uh, you're all fucking mad. All of you. I'll repeat that. You're all fucking mad. <laughs> and why are you mad? Well, I'm going to go into that. And I'm mad as well. And by mad, I don't mean angry, but I'm angry. I may sound angry. Um, I mean insane. And insanity is one of the stock in trade of the psychotherapy um, profession. And I'd just like to run a little quote past you um, from one of my favorite psychotherapists, R.D. Lang. Who's heard of R.D. Lang? One. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> he was uh, kind of like one of the big names in psychotherapy like uh, 50 years ago. Um, he said, uh, one of the many things he said is, insanity, a perfectly rational adjustment to an insane world. Which is why you're mad. You're mad because you're living in an insane world. And the, in, the world of business is insane, largely. There are some organizations that are absolutely certifiable. And there's a whole bunch of other organizations which are more or less dodgy when it comes to their mental health. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. But I'm sure you don't want to talk about it. <laughs> because it's career-threatening if you start talking about these things. Okay, so you're mad, and what, what does that, where does that get you? It, why, wh how does it manifest itself? In this particular case of the Agile world and this conference, you're mad because you're doing Agile. Maybe you're even being Agile, which is even like more madder. Um, and why is that mad? It's because, if we go back to Snowbird, the whole Agile label and the whole Agile movement kind of grew out of Snowbird. Um, there were roots going back before then. But Snowbird itself and the Declaration and the Manifesto and the Principles all grew out of the madness that those Chaps, mainly. I don't think, were there any women at Snowbird? I can't quite remember. No? All oh, right. Um, those chaps then, they were living in organizations where they were mad and mad. They were angry because they were wasting their talents, they felt. Uh, and they were mad because they were continuing to work in those organizations. Okay, you don't get a lot of choice, perhaps. You may be, maybe your argument, you know, you can either work for these kinds of companies, and I'm banks, I'm looking at you particularly, um, or you can go and starve. So it's not a great choice. Personally, I've chosen the go and starve route, but uh, I'm not that starved yet. Um, but, uh, you know, I appreciate the rock and the hard place that you find yourself kind of trapped between. But one of my particular issues with Agile, you probably won't want me to kind of have some kind of argument, some kind of rationale, around why it's, uh, well, as I said in the panel session yesterday, uh, a 20-year detour or a cul-de-sac or a dead end. Um, because all of you, I know, spend a huge amount of your time and focus and energy on trying to make things better. You're trying to, you think, uh, we've seen it today, you know, in the, in the lightning talks uh, and in the two-day two sessions. Lots of people offering lots of advice on how to do things better. And that's what uh, John Seddon, amongst other people, would call doing the wrong things righter. Because Agile is a wrong thing, and we're all trying to do it righter. My argument is, let's try and do something else. Let's try and do, uh, move beyond the Agile question into the sunny uplands of actually really addressing the issues that we're, we're trying to um, tend to by being agile. Reset. Let's go back to another line of thought. Um, for 50 years, and again I said this in the panel session yesterday, for 50 years and more, the software industry has been trying to get better. Let's just let's stay with the generalization there. Trying to improve, <laughs> whether that's improving productivity or profitability or quality of life or customer satisfaction, whatever it is, 
and everybody's got kind of a different uh, take on what's most important. But let's just say we're trying to get better. And for 50 years, the, mo the needle really has hardly moved at all. I mean, you can look at the data. I'm not really a great fan of data. I really kind of try and be a little bit more uh, visceral about these things. How does it feel to me? Um, and I, as I said, I've been in the industry, industry 50 years, um, man and boy, and it doesn't feel to me like it's getting any better. Uh, maybe, maybe on the upside of the agile question, it's better in terms of a place to work or a way of working. It's, it's better for you people, but is it better for the companies? I don't think so. It certainly gives executives a lot more stress than the status quo. Um, is it better for customers? I don't see a lot of uh, arguments in that favour. Um, I know all the software that I use on a regular basis is broken as shit. <laughs> and I'm, you know, it doesn't, I mean, I'm Google, I'm looking at you, for example. Um, <laughs> Google apps, particularly. Um, so, for 50 years, we've been trying to make things better. And who knows the story of the drunk who lost his car keys? No, is that not a popular story in Poland? Oh, I'll, I'll tell it to you then. Okay, you, it, may, it may come back to you. Um, so the drunk loses his car keys uh, and he's wandering about in the street looking for them. And his friend says, um, why are you looking for your car keys over there? Uh, because you lost them over here. Uh, and, he, and the drunk says, well, it's because uh, the light's better over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a like, sad joke, but there we go. Um, and for me, Agile is much the same thing. You know, why are you looking for your Agile car keys over there? Well, the light's better. And what is that light? What's, what's the illumination on, on that part of the street that we're looking, that we label the Agile part of the street? It's because we're talking about processes, methods, tools, technology. It's been a long history of trying to uh, come up with better methods better tools, better processes, better technology. Not only like supporting technology, but the technology we actually weave into our products. And that's not really, for me, uh, it's taken me a long time to realize it. It's taken me 50 years to realize it. Um, it's not where the car keys are. And the car keys are successful business, um, a happier life for the people involved. The needs of the people the folks' needs, coming back to the antimatter principle, are not over there where the light's good. They're over here in this dark corner labeled people things. And organizations don't want to go into that dark corner because it's scary and it's non-traditional. And who here feels that they have to wear a special face at work? You call it work face, which isn't really you as a person, but it's what the ex organization expects you to look like and behave like while you're in work. Who feels that they have to do that? One. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe it's because you're English and we all have to do it in England, but <laughs> I suspect it's a lot more than one. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's a typical... Um, experience of people in work, particularly in work in large organizations, you have to leave yourself and your, um, particularly your emotions and your feelings and, and your aspect as a human being, you have to leave it at the door as you walk in in the mornings and then as you walk out in the evenings you can pick it up again and you can be a normal person again. But while you're in work, you have to be something else, you have to be like a cross between a, a computer and a drone. Uh, and you have to do what you're told. And uh, I mean, this is like traditional organizations particularly. You have to play a role which isn't necessarily who you are, but is who you're expected to be. So for me, that, that, that dark corner of the street is where we should be looking. It's where the opportunities for being successful, for upping our game, for becoming a much more productive industry, um, Lie. But who's looking there? Um, who here is working with an organization that has got a really credible people initiative? That's uh, zero. Oh, one. Oh, well, we heard about your talk, didn't we? Yes, I, I, I grant you that. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess you know what I'm talking about. Um, so that's where my 
focus has been since I kind of had this. Well, I chose this path after having chosen all the other paths. I've been there, I've done the methods, I've done the processes, I've done the tools, I've done the technology. And it's all shiny, it's all much fun, it's all very engaging intellectually. Uh, it's much more fun and engaging intellectually than dealing with people, which is a very messy and ugly kind of uh, corner of the street. But let's not deny where we've come from. Uh, Elaine was... Is Elaine here? Uh, you were talking about uh, millions of years of evolution to get to where we are as a species today. Um, and those millions of years have had some impact on us. <laughs> You know, they've had some formative impact on what we are. We're communal. We work together. We live together. We share things together. Um, we've got a brain which doesn't necessarily work in the way that uh, our organisations would like our brains to work. They're not computers. They're much more mushy and uh, unreliable than that. Um, let's just recognise that we are human beings. We're not automatons. More to the point, we're collaborative human beings. And working together is not something that we spend a lot of time focused on as a discipline. We kind of hope it's going to happen. Uh, we kind of um, hire scrum masters and agile coaches to help us work together as collaborative teams. But I was reading on Twitter only yesterday, you know, where's, where's, the teach, where's the teaching in schools and higher education on how to work together collaboratively? Unless you're at some kind of special school, it doesn't happen. It certainly doesn't happen in the state sector. <laughs> Did I hit a note, or was it? Was it do you work, uh, have you been to a school where it's been different? Okay, we'll leave that one. Um, so there is so much scope for doing things better if we recognise that we're human beings trying to work together to do things better. Uh, and if we take some um, deliberate steps in that direction, and that's a huge raft of uh, wisdom, knowledge, in books, uh, in uh, research papers, um, in neuroscience, there's a new, new area that uh, kind of contributes to that whole question. And the, the, the essence, the thing that's changed, really, is, well, two, twofold. One, society's changing, probably not entirely uh, at the speed some of us would like, and not entirely in the directions, always, that some of us would like. But certainly in the general direction, for me, I see society changing as becoming more compassionate, um, more, particularly in Europe uh, and in the UK, we have... Uh, uh, national benefits for people who are less, less privileged or less uh, capable, less uh, able to look after themselves. Uh, we look after them as a society. Um, that's, that's, for me, that's kind of progress. And, and the other thing that's changed is we're now in, a, in an area, in an in a industry that's particularly predicated on collaborative knowledge work. And collaborative knowledge work is not like the kind of work that used to be managed and run in factories and railroads and other places 50 or 100 years ago. I mean, we didn't actually have organisations much before the late uh, 19th century. The, the, sm the largest organisation, I think, was probably, apart from things like the Catholic Church, um, but in terms of commercial organisations, it was about five or six people up until 1870, 1880. And then the railroads came along and management theory emerged to run large organisations like the railroads uh, and like General Motors. And people were doing brawn work basically then, kind of pink muscle work, lifting things up, moving things from place to place, screwing things together, packing things into boxes, all that kind of physical work could well be and was described by Taylor um, as something that could be managed in a way that was treating people much like uh, automatons 
you know, we need you to put this for eight hours a day. You just take these off of here and put them in a box and take these off of here. And, and then eight hours later, you can go home and then we do it again tomorrow. Now, knowledge work isn't like that. And particularly, collaborative knowledge work isn't like that. We have to be a lot more um, appreciative of how the brain works and how people interact together. You know, society, collaboration in that sense. Uh, the society of the workplace. Not only the society, not just the broader society of the country that we're, we're in. So, I'm, I'm going to leave a few minutes for questions at the end, so I'm going to wrap up now. Um, this is kind of why I wanted to be brief and to the point. You're all mad, you're working in mad organisations, and how do we deal with that? How do we get from a set of organisations, which is most of them, 80% of organisations are thinking in what I call analytic terms, which is, uh, as I said yesterday, breaking things up into small pieces and managing the small pieces individually. You might call that silos, such that the, uh, on, on the assumption that if you manage each individual piece correctly, then the whole thing, the whole organisation is going to work well. We know that's not true. It's never been true. But now we're getting to a point where it actually matters. Because we know, A, we know better ways, and B, we're doing a different kind of work. So how do we go about changing that perception, that model of the world in the minds of the people that are working in organizations? And one way is telling you that this is going on and inviting you to think about the implications for these kinds of changes and the kind of inf knowledge that's out there that we could be using to deal with them and pr passing that message on to other people in organizations who have perhaps more influence, maybe middle and senior managers who are not really talking about these things. Um, they talk about business strategies and finance and share prices and a whole bunch of other things, but they don't often talk about what do we believe as an organization? What do we believe about the world of work and how it should work? Are we, to, go, to come back to McGregor from yesterday, are we theory X people? Which is, please don't hit me anymore. I will do the work if you just leave me alone. Um, that's theory X, you know, the belief that everybody is lazy and idle and you have to beat them with a stick to get any work out of them. To theory Y organizations and the theory Y set of beliefs, which is, yay, I love to come work here. This is why. Um, because everybody believes that I'm actually trying to do a good job and they're going out of their way to make it possible for me to do a good job without actually giving me any grief or aggravation or punishment to try and make me do things. Now, I know from long and bitter experience which, which of those two I prefer, and I suspect that I know which of those, those two most of you would prefer, but how do we get there? Because we're not there at the moment. We're not there anywhere near there. And that's why I say organizations are mad, and you're mad, you're contributing to that madness by just supporting that existing status quo. I, I don't say you're going out of your way to do it consciously, but just by your participation. Um, as a closing remark, I don't vote. I've never voted. I don't vote on principle because I don't believe the system works. Particularly in England, I don't believe that first past the post was ever a good idea. And I'm not going to vote until the system changes. I, I don't expect to see that in my lifetime. <laughs> but that's my stand. That's my personal stand. So I invite you to consider whether you might like to take a personal stand and what that, the nature of that might be. Um, in the nature of what I've been talking about today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Do we have time for uh, questions? We can squeeze one question. Should there be one? Anybody? Uh, uh, Malcolm? Malcolm. <laughs> no. Uh. So I, I think one of the reasons that organizations stay mad is that that madness is comfortable for the people at the top of the organization. Yeah. And 
in order to change that, we have to be able to get people at the top of our organization to do uncomfortable things. Yeah. Do you have any idea how we can get them to do those uncomfortable things? Um, channeling my therapy, experience from therapy, um, you can't get people to do anything. We can't force or coerce or oblige senior management to even engage with these discussions, let alone do anything about them. But, again, from therapy, some people choose to go into therapy. Some people are unhappy enough with the, the current nature of their lives, say their relationships with their children or their wives or whatever, um, but they want to do something about it. They, they, come, they come to a point, maybe a crisis point, maybe a low, where they say, I've got to do something. I can't carry on like this in my life. It's too miserable, it's too depressing, it's too frustrating, whatever the emotions involved are, but they're generally negative emotions. And you get to a point where you say, okay, I'm going to do something about that. And then maybe one out of ten of those people do something like going and reading self-help books and another one out of ten go and do something else. They like, talk to their mother or their friends or something. And maybe one out of ten go and find a therapist and start therapy. And, and I think there's enough research on the efficaciousness of therapy to say that it works for a lot of those people. Um, so my role as an organisational psychotherapist is to offer that same option to companies. If, the, if those few companies who get to the point where they say, we can't go on as we are, we continually disappoint our customers, we continually fail to make the kind of numbers we think we're capable of, um, whatever the, the negative emotions that they're feeling at that time. Some of them may, if they know of the option of therapy, organisational therapy, they may choose to go into that kind of thing. And, and organisational psychotherapy may sound like a big thing, but actually it's very simple. It's just saying, you don't have to do it by yourself. You don't have to tackle all of these big, scary issues which are uncomfortable by yourself. You can have somebody who knows a little bit about it, who's been through it before with others, who's in a position to help and support you emotionally as much as anything. Um, and you can ca uh, that service is available and you can call on it. Is that an option that would make it even slightly more possible that you might en en engage with the question? Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Bob.